Has anything ever happened to you that you just kind of responded by saying, why me? Why in the world did that happen, happen to me? I try to live right. I try to do right. I try to follow what God wants me to follow. Why in the world did that have to happen to me? I'm going to tell you a story of something that happened to me yesterday, and I understand it's a little bit trivial looking back at it, but at the time, it was definitely not trivial. Every day, uh, every afternoon, I also put together both the dogs just weigh a little less than I do. And when I walk them, the story's a little long, but you'll understand when I tell you all this. Uh, when I walk these dogs, I put a body harness on both of them. It's got a metal D-clip on their back, and they've both got about a six-foot leash, and I hook those leashes to each of them. And then instead of having a dog in each hand or one, both in one hand that are pulling me way out here, I've got a harness that wraps around my waist, and it's a tandem harness that I hook both dogs to, and then the harness is hooked to me. That way they're not pulling me all over the countryside. And so the dogs are hooked to me, they're hooked to each other, and we walk. And usually when I walk them, we walk a couple of miles. And so yesterday afternoon or evening, Christy and I had been working in the garden. It was hot, and about 7 o'clock, about maybe 30, 45 minutes before sunset, I decided I'd walk the dogs. And so we walk about a two-mile path, and I've got nearly, uh, it was a beautiful evening, and nice and pretty, enjoying the outside, and, and, and I got nearly to the end of our walk. And there'd been this area where there's a really big culvert and some really tall grass. And once before, my dog said kind of got after a groundhog, a whistle pig that had been over in the grass over there. And so they, uh, as we're walking by this area, uh, the dogs kind of got interested in something and went over in the tall grass there. And I thought probably to myself, it's just that old groundhog. And then I saw it. What I thought was the groundhog, the big dark brown hog, brown groundhog there, and so, uh, and this is where it all kind of happened, kind of in a blur. And I'll try to tell you the best I remember it. And so, as I'm walking, they get after this big groundhog, what I think is a big groundhog in the grass. I grab their leash, and they've grabbed the groundhog by the time I can do anything about it. And they're pulling it, and they're shaking it, and I've got a hold of their leash. And then I thought to myself, why does that really dark groundhog have a white stripe down its back? <laughs> and this is where it all kind of happened real quick, okay? About that time, as near as I can remember, I unclipped the dogs from me. I smelled something, and I ran as far away from them as I could. And it's one of those kind of, and they've got this skunk, polecat, in their mouth. They're shaking it, they're pulling it apart, and it didn't take long and the skunk was dead, but then it all kind of sunk in, right? I smelled it. You ever smelled a skunk and then your nose kind of stopped working and you can just taste it because it's so bitter in the air? That's exactly what happened. And now I've got another dilemma. They've killed this skunk. They're hooked to each, they're no longer hooked to me, thankfully, but they're hooked to each other. And my golden retriever, you know, a retriever, when it goes and gets something, what's it want to do with it, right? My retriever now is carrying that dead skunk they've killed. I'm as far away from the house as I can possibly be. I don't want to touch the dogs, of course, because they're both foaming at the mouth and they stink terribly. And so now I've got to get him to let that skunk go. And so finally I convinced them to let the skunk go. Smell is terrible. We, I try to stay as far away from them as I can until we get home. I've still got to unhook the harness, harnesses from them. And by the time all said and done, the dogs stink terribly. Somehow I've managed just to get a little bit on my fingers. But I thought to myself after all of this, why did that happen to me? Of all things in the world that could have happened, why did my dogs kill a skunk on the walk that afternoon? And, you know, I understand. That's a little trivial, right? It wasn't at the time for sure, but that's a little trivial. But, you know, sometimes things happen in life that make us wonder why. Why does a person have this suffering in their life? Why does somebody deal with the, the trials that they deal with? Why did somebody get sick? Why does someone we love suffer or die? Why do people lose their job? Why do children in a school where it ought to be 
one of the safest places you can imagine. Why is there massacres that occur in places like that? Why does calamity and devastation and disease and catastrophe happen? Sometimes all of us are made to ask the question, why? And my friend, I, I want to point you today to the example of a man who faced more than we can probably ever begin to imagine, more than we can ever again to even fathom, and yet he persevered through that. And I want us to see what this man faced, what he learned from it, and what can we learn from it as well. And so you probably know by now, but I want to ask you to open your Bible to the book of Job. Would you open to Job with me? This morning we're going to consider, you know, everything we know about Job. Job was a good man. Job chapter 1, verses 1 through 3 tells us there was a man who lived in the land of Uz whose name was Job. Now listen to Job's character, a godly man. That man was blameless, upright, one who feared God and shunned evil. Job was definitely trying to live a good life. He was trying to do right, and yet out of nowhere it seems like all these calamity after calamity begins to happen to Job. And so I want you to consider with me in the book of Job for just a few moments, Job's suffering. Look in Job chapter 1, and I want you to notice beginning in verse 6 how Job begins to suffer at the hand of Satan. Look in Job chapter 1. Look in verse number 6. The Bible says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. Now, friend, there's a lot here I wish I knew more about. Why is this council going on? Why are the sons of God coming before God? Why is Satan allowed in there? What, what's going on in heaven at this time and before God? And we just don't have a whole lot of detail about that. We know that, that God's servants, God's angels, they take care of his people. They accomplish his will. We know that Satan has evil purposes in this, but there is this, there's this heavenly council, and Satan comes in. Look in Job chapter 1. And watch what God says to Satan. And the Lord said to Satan, From where do you come? So Satan answered the Lord and said, From going to and fro on the earth and from walking back and forth. On it. What was Satan doing? Just having a casual stroll down there? Was he out just getting a good walk and some exercise? Well, friend, you'll see real quickly. His purposes are malevolent. Look, if you would, in verse number 8. Watch what God says next. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So Satan answered the Lord and said, does Job fear God for nothing? That's probably the key question in the book of Job. You know, suffering is really a byproduct of the main idea of Job. The main idea of Job is disinterested righteousness, meaning this. If God takes away all the blessings, if there are no benefits, if there are no blessings, if God is, isn't blessing his children with all these things, will men and women still serve God because he's worthy? Will we serve God because it's the right thing to do apart from the blessings? And so Satan says, yeah, I've considered Job, but the only reason he serves you is because you've, you've built this hedge of blessings around here. Satan affirms that, and God says, no, that's not the case, and I'll let you prove that. Look in Job chapter 1, verse 10. Satan says, have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You've blessed the work of his hands. His possessions have increased in the land. But here's what Satan says. But now, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, 
all that he has is in your power. Only don't lay a hand on his person. And so God affirms Satan will, or Job will still serve me because it's the right thing to do. Satan says, serve you. The only reason, the only reason Job serves you is because you've made this perimeter of blessings around him, around his family, and around all that he has. You take that away, and Job will curse you to your face. And so God says, no, that's not the case. Satan says, oh, I bet he will. And God says, okay, I'm going to let you take some of that away. God allowed that to happen through the work of Satan to prove men will serve God because it's right. Now, watch what happens. Look at the first test of Job where Satan takes away, begins to take away some of these things. Look in Job 1, beginning in verse 13. Now there was a day when his, that's Job's sons and daughters, were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, The oxen were plowing, and the donkeys feeding besides them, beside them when the Sabaeans raided them and took them away. Indeed, they killed the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell it. Now, almost immediately, while he was still speaking, Another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven, burned up the sheep and the servants, and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels, took them away, yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. I alone have escaped to tell you. Now watch again. While he was still speaking, Another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house, and suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness, struck the four corners of the house, it fell on the young people, and they are dead. And I alone have escaped to tell you. In a, in a successive matter of just a few minutes, Job has four servants left to his name. One of the wealthiest men in that age. And look what happened to him. Sabaeans raided and took away his donkeys. Chaldeans took away his camels. Fire came down and burned up the sheep. Now friend, let's put this in terms we can understand. A man's wealth was measured by his livestock. His wealth was measured by his, his camels, his oxen, his donkey, and his sheep. It, it put it in our terms that we might understand. Job had a black Monday and he lost everything. Financially. He's got zero. Four servants is all he's got left. Now, friend, that would be bad enough to lose everything you own, all your wealth, all your financial security in one day. But then it gets worse. His children, all ten of them, in their oldest brother's house. Some people say that they were celebrating there. On, on, each one celebrated his own day. Some people say, commentaries will say, that they were celebrating their oldest brother's birthday. And on that day, a wind, something like what we might think of like a massive tornado, hits the house, it comes down on those young people, all ten of them die in one fell swoop. Can you imagine that? Lost as wealth lost everything he owned, and on top of that, to hear the news, all ten of your children are dead in one fell swoop, some catastrophe? Surely when you stand back from that, how's Job going to respond? Naturally, he's going to say, right, why me? You think at this point, Job is going to be angry and he's going to curse God, right? Why did God let this happen? It's not what Job does. Look in Job chapter 1. See if you can fathom this. Look in Job chapter 1. Notice how Job responds in verses 20 through 22. Look at Job's reaction to this heart-wrenching uh, turn of events. Then Job arose, tore his robe, and shaved his head. And he fell to the ground, watch this, and worshipped. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb, and naked shall I return. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. In all this, Job did not sin, 
nor charge God with wrong. If you found out that you were bankrupt, if you found out that your children had just died, are you going to feel like worshiping? Are you going to say like Job, Lord gives and the Lord takes away, blessed be the name of the Lord? Friend, I'd say we'd be hysterical if something like that happened to us. We would probably be in shock. We'd be beside ourselves. Yet Job, great man of God, still, he's hurting. There's no doubt. He shaves his head. Job's in a great state of mourning, but he doesn't give up. And so this first test, Job has passed that. But it's about to get a lot worse. Look in Job chapter 2. Now, Satan is again going to come before God, and he's going to ask more to threaten Job. Look in Job chapter 2, verse number 1. Again, kind of same scenario, heavenly counsel. Again, there was a day, Job 2 verse 1, when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord. And Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, from where do you come? Satan answered the similar way and said, from going to and fro, back and forth, walking on the earth. And the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth? a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. And listen to this. And God kind of gouges Satan here, and still he holds fast his integrity, although you incited me against him to destroy him without cause. And so God basically says, you tried to get him to curse me. You took away everything that was dear to him, and he still holds fast to his integrity. Now watch Satan's plan. So Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yes, all that a man has, he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand now, touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. Now watch what happens. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he's in your hand. Spare his life, though. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful boils from the sole of his foot to the crown of his head. He took for himself a, a potsherd with which to scrape himself while he sat in the midst of the ashes. Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. And so the first set of tests, the first test is about taking everything from Job, uh, taking everything except his life. He's got his children, he's got his wealth, finances, all of that. Second one is a lot closer to home in the sense that now Job is suffering physically. Um, let, me, let me tell you a little bit about what Job faced. Of course we know from chapter 2, verse 7, he's got painful boils from the bottom of his foot to the top of his head. I don't know if you've ever known anybody or if you've ever had a sore like that, but a painful boil, it, it, it swells. I know this is a little gross, but it swells. It gets infected. Eventually it'll pop. Pus will come out. And it hurts all over. Imagine having those from the bottom of your foot to the top of your head. Uh, probably one of the things that might give you an idea. If you've ever had shingles and you know how that feels, that probably doesn't even begin to compare really. But it might give you a mental idea. Hurting, burning, pain from head to toe. Can you imagine Job dealing with that? Uh, look at what Job went through. Take your finger and look at this with me. Uh, look in Job chapter 7. Let, let me describe what this disease was like. Job faced sleeplessness. Look in Job chapter 7, verse number 4. Job says, Like a man who earnestly desires the shade, uh, excuse me, verse 4, When I lie down, I say, When shall I arise and the night be ended? For I had my fill of tossing till dawn. And so when Job lays down and tries to go to sleep, he's sleepless. Look in chapter 7, verse 5. He has rotten, cr cracked, pus-filled skin. My flesh is caked with worms. 
and dust. My skin is cracked and breaks out afresh. Look in chapter 18, verse 13. Job describes it as rottenness of the bones. Chapter 18, verse 13. He says of this disease, it devours patches of his skin. The firstborn of death devours his limbs. Uh, chapter 30, verses 17 and 19, he describes it as great anguish and pain. Look in chapter 30, verse 30. This is such a vivid image. Chapter 30, verse number 30. My skin grows black and falls from me, and Job says, and my bones burn with fever. Friend, when you think about somebody who had a terrible physical ailment, we don't know exactly what the disease is, but it reminds us a little bit of someone who's got leprosy. Painful boils head to toe, cracked skin, flesh fault. Here's how bad it was. Think about this. It's so bad, Job sits in the ash heap and he takes a piece of pottery or glass and for comfort, he scrapes the dead skin off his body. Can you imagine what Job was going through here? And on top of that, along with the second test, instead of his wife encouraging him soothing him, consoling him, and telling him to hang in there. What does his wife do? He, he says, uh, she says, look at all that you're going through. Why don't you just curse God and die and get over this? His wife, who should have helped him, is now working against him. Well, how does Job deal with this problem? Look in Job chapter 2. Again, we are so impressed with Job's character. Look at Job's response. Chapter 2, let's read verses 9 and 10 again. The Bible says this, Then Job's wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. Now watch this. He said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? And all this, Job did not sin with his lips. And then you may remember the story. Job now has three friends who come to Job, and their whole message, which takes up about chapter 3, nearly through the end of the book, is this. This is their whole message to Job. You've sinned, you've messed up, God did this because of your sin, you need to repent and God will make all this right. And of course that's not true. And so Job's lost everything he owns, he went bankrupt, all ten of his children have died, he's lost his health, his wife has encouraged him to curse God, and his friends, who aren't really very good friends, are saying, you're a sinner, repent. Job has it like no one you can imagine in this life. And yet he never, ever gave up. And so let's think about that question. Why did Job face this suffering? Why do we? Why do you? Why do I? Why do people today face suffering, calamity, disease, and problems? And how do we deal with that? Friend, we learn first of all that Job suffered as a direct result of Satan too many times, and I hope you'll, hope you'll understand the way I'm saying this, too many times when something bad happens in life, when I face disease or sickness or calamity or whatever it may be, some catastrophe, too many times we are so quick to say, why did God do this? Why did God allow this? Why is God allowing me to suffer? And we forget this. There's an enemy out there, a very serious enemy who has my spiritual demise and your spiritual demise as his main goal. Remember what Satan was doing? Going to and fro, back and forth on the earth. Uh, have you considered my servant Job? That implies that what Satan was doing down there on the earth was actively, aggressively seeking people to devour. And friend, when I think about the, the, the suffering we face, when I think about the evil in the world, when I think about death, who brought death into the world? 
You realize as well as I do, Adam and Eve opened that door, but who was standing there saying, look at this fruit, it's so good, and they took in that. Well, friend, we need to factor in, Satan is still at work today. Think about Luke 22, verse number 31. Here's what Jesus says. Jesus says to Simon, 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 Satan has, has, uh, uh, Satan has tempted you. He wants to desire, devour you and separate you as the wheat from the chaff. But Jesus said, I've prayed for you that your faith would not falter. Satan desires to have us just as well. He's actively, aggressively working. Now hold your finger here and look in, hold your finger in the book of Job. And I want you to flip over to 1 Peter 5 with me. 1 Peter chapter 5. Look in your Bible in verse number 8. I want you to see the militant, aggressive nature still of our enemy today. First Peter chapter 5. Look at verse number 8. Watch what Peter here says. Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil walks about like a roaring lion seeking whom he may devour. How's the devil presented here? Like an aggressive, a devouring lion actively looking for people to tempt and destroy. Friend, when you think about Satan, see him in his aggressive, militant, destructive nature that he is. And so when suffering, when bad things happen, when catastrophe and calamity and disease and sickness, let's not be so quick to automatically blame God. Let's realize there's an evil force out there. God has allowed that to exist in the world in which it live, and we've got to be aware of that. Secondly, as you think about why this suffering happened to Job and why suffering may happen to men and women today, let's realize that the reason Job was allowed to suffer was to prove to Satan and to prove to the world Christians will serve God for nothing. Friend, as in my life and yours... We are an example to the world, right? Matthew 5, verse 16. The Bible teaches us that we are going to have to face temptation and testing and, and count it all joy when you fall into various trials. may very well be the case that in my life and yours, the testing and the tempting that we face may be to prove just as well that God is God and men will serve Him for nothing. I want you to think about this. What if God... What if God took everything, all the blessings away from you? All the blessings, all the good things you have, all the benefits, all the things that we as God's children have been blessed with. If God took all of that away, would you still serve Him? If there was no side benefit, if there were no blessings, just because God is God, He's worthy of it and it's the right thing to do. Would you serve Him? You know, too many people have the idea that, that the reason we serve God is because of the benefits. That's not true. We serve God because He's God. Do you remember in the book of John, John chapter 6, they wanted to take Jesus and make Him a king. Do you remember why they wanted to do that? Because He just fed the 5,000. Because of the physical benefit of Jesus feeding the 5,000, some people wanted to take and make Him a king. That way everybody could be full and happy. Friend, that's not the way it works. I understand there are benefits to following God. But would we serve God anyway? If all of those benefits were gone, would we serve God just because it's the right thing or do we do it because of what we can get out of it? All right, thirdly, I want to mention to you that another reason sometimes that we suffer is to purify and help us realize what really matters in this life. I want you to take your Bible and open to James chapter 5. The only other mention, the only other commentary we really have about Job is found in the book of James. Turn to James chapter 5 and, 
And I want you to see how Job is set up as someone who went through the trials, was purified by them, and is now a good example to us. James chapter 5. Look at verse number 11. The Bible says this. Indeed, we count them blessed who endure. You have heard of the patience, or New King James says, perseverance, stick to itness. You've heard of the perseverance of Job and seen the end intended by the Lord, that the Lord is very compassionate and merciful. You know, Job has some deficiencies. He never sinned, he never charged God with wrong, but Job cursed the day he was born. Job said at one point, why wasn't I just born a stillborn and died at birth? Why did they say, what a great day this is, a male child's been born. It would have been better if you killed me at birth, God. Job had some questions. He had some things in his heart that he had to work out. And when you look at what Job went through from the beginning to the end, Job is so much stronger by what he faced in the end. Friends, sometimes it's those sufferings that purify us. It's like metal. In working with metal, you heat metal up to a really hot point. And that heating of the metal up, when it glows as hot as you can imagine, it purifies it, it, it gets rid of all the imperfections, it helps it to hold its strength and maintain its solid nature. Friend, that's my life and yours. Can't, listen to this. Count it all joy when you face various trials. What do you mean? Listen to this now. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces patience. But let patience have its perfect work, that you may be complete and perfect, lacking in nothing. If anyone lacks wisdom, let him ask of God. What's James 1 verses 2 through 5 teach? When I face suffering, when I face difficulty, when problems and trials and calamity come into my life, friend, it helps me to realize what really, really matters in this life. And friend, this is the idea I want us to really think about this morning. Suffering, disease, sickness, calamity. You know what it does? It helps me to focus on the things that are most important in this life. Job lost everything. His wealth, his children, his wife told him to curse God. He lost his health. But you know what Job didn't lose? The most important thing ever. His faith and his trust in God. I believe this is one of the greatest verses in all the Bible. I want you to take your Bible, and I want you to see what... You talk about a man to hold up as an example. Look at Job 13. This is such a powerful commentary on Job and how he never... He may have lost everything, but he never lost his trust in God. Look in Job 13. This is a verse you ought to highlight or underline in your Bible. Look at what Job says. Job 13, verse 15. Job says, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him. Job felt like God was doing all this, and even though he felt that way, Job said, Yet will I trust him. Friend, no matter what we have or don't have, the most important thing for a Christian to remember is we have God. We have our faith. We have the hope of heaven. Paul said in Romans 8, 18, I consider the sufferings of this present world, they're not even worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And so we ask it again today. Sometimes we ask the question, why me? Have you ever asked that question? God, why did you allow me to suffer? Why did you allow this disease or sickness or death or calamity and, and hurting in my life? And when we ask that, friend, we need, to be, we need to be reminded we're Christians. We have faith in God. It, it's not promised that everything's always going to be smooth and easy sailing. But it is promised that if we follow Christ, we'll have the hope of heaven. And so how are you dealing with the suffering in your life? Are we continuing to trust in God? Or have we at some points wanted to curse God? and just for it to all be over with. Let, let me show you. You know, James 5.11 
says, consider the end intended by the Lord for Job. And I want you to, let's not leave the story untold. I want you to see how it worked out when Job continued to trust in God. Look in Job chapter 42. Flip ahead in the book, and there's a lot of material that we can't cover, but I want you to see how it worked out when Job continued to trust in God. Look in Job 42. That man of suffering who went bankrupt, who lost ten children in a day, who lost his health more than we can ever imagine. Look at Job 42, 12. Now the Lord blessed the latter days of Job more than his beginning. What do you mean? He had 14,000 sheep, 6,000 camels, 1,000 yoke of oxen, 1,000 female donkeys. He also had seven sons and three daughters. And it goes on to tell what he called them. Verse 16, after this, Job lived 140 years, saw his children, grandchildren for four generations, so Job died old and full of days. How did it work out for Job when he continued to trust in God? We're not saying that there aren't going to be difficult patches in your life. We're not saying there aren't going to be some really hard and challenging times. There very well may be. But what we are saying is this. If, you conti if we continue to trust in God, if we continue to put our faith in Him, in the end, it's all going to work out well. Remember again, Paul said, I consider the sufferings of this present time. They're not worthy to be compared with the glory which shall be revealed in us. And so, friend, how have you dealt with the suffering that you face? Have you continued to put your trust in God? If not, then, friend, come back to that. Remain faithful to God. Continue to realize that He's going to see you through the problems that you face in this life. If you're not a child of God, surely after looking at these ideas, why would anyone not want to, everybody's going to face difficulty. You know what's different about the Christian? He has somebody to lean on. He has someone to help see him through that. He has a God who cares and the hope of heaven. If you've never obeyed the gospel, friend, we're urging you to do that today. If you need to respond in any way, as always, we want you to know God loves you. We love you. Won't you come as we stand and sing?